The aging of games is an interesting and popular topic, as it is with any other art form. And like other art forms, you can look back and trace a number of changes that happen with popularity, or technological advancements, or just general societal shifts. Gaming is a little different though, first because of how young it is, but also because it's more closely woven into our nostalgic organs due to its interactivity. When we play historian with gaming, our tastes so heavily differ from person to person that objectively true facts will be significantly harder to diffuse than they would with something like a film or a song, even though that's pretty damn hard already. The nature of this can be applied to criticism as well, and how it ages. Beyond the fact that it's entertaining to read old reviews raving about the lifelike graphics in some old game, it's interesting noting how an opinion relies so heavily on time, place, and the looming climate of gaming. I could talk about great games with bad reviews for a while, but one game that kept entering my mind's eye when I thought about this was Singularity. The game didn't really receive bad reviews, but they certainly weren't gleaming. It seems like a game that was definitely destined to be forgotten, but never really was. A game whose streamlined mechanics were slapped for being old school, but would now be celebrated for the same fact. This can be said about a lot of the things that Singularity attempted, and the game is by no means a classic, but it's certainly worth some thought. It also highlights a lot of issues that arise when thinking about criticism and the gaming platform, because Singularity was not a game worth the full price of admission at the time of its release. It had problems, major problems, it was short, and its ambitions never fully delivered. But today, the game is absolutely worth its generally low price. Games like this exist entirely through word of mouth, and part of its strength is in its cult status. And that's the greatest part of gaming's intense experiential ties. It can sometimes supersede professional criticism, whose relevance and impact can fade with time. The coolest thing about this is that poorly received games can have a late second life. Not to say it doesn't happen with music or movies, rest in peace Nick Drake, just in gaming it happens more frequently and with more intensity. Now, Singularity is a weird game, but its cult appreciation is understandable. First and foremost, because it is, put simply, a lot of fun. Singularity wears its inspirations pretty blatantly, with elements of Half-Life and Bioshock being the base components of the mixture. It's not something that detracts from the game in any way, and almost makes it feel familiar and comfortable, a warm memory from your childhood, faded but lingering. But this also gives the game a hand-me-down feeling, or like listening to someone describe a cool dream they had. A feeling that can only come from a Camaro-like singularity. This chimeric quality is also due to the absolutely grueling development process of the game. It got cancelled and revived and then consequently trimmed down and picked at until the product we have today arrived in stores. The developers even openly admitted to desperately grabbing at things like Bioshock to complete the game. Thankfully, its problems are mostly overshadowed because, as I said, it's a complete blast. The gameplay is mechanically sound, and as a shooter, it's more than common. I can't comment on how it performed on its home consoles at the time of release, but right now and on PC it's a dream. Smooth, inoffensive, and tactile. The human enemies in the game provide the most entertaining bits of fighting. Their AI isn't remarkable, but the fights play out explosively, and the various weapons and skills you are given perfectly complement encounters with enemies that can take cover and shoot back at you. It's also a problem, though, because of how meaty and solid human encounters feel when compared to the fights with mutants mutants, and otherworldly, eldritch creatures. Most other enemies are humanoids whose attack patterns are just not as interesting or lively as a soldier's. The humans also fall to pieces with a shotgun blast or explosion, their animations are well done, and more than anything they're just familiar as opposed to these other things you're facing. And that statement sounds like I favor complacency, but in later stages you're asked to kill strange spider creatures and such whose designs just don't reward accuracy or tactical play. You just just send damage in their direction and lazily stomp along once they've toppled over. The other non-human creatures that you fight are also hindered by the constant use of invincibility frames and their reaction animations, which is possibly my least favorite thing to see in shooters, and it completely destroys the solidity of the combat. For example, in a shooting game, if you see a soldier jump over a fence and you shoot him while he's climbing over that fence, the game won't register him taking damage. And it sounds small, but upon repetition and just 
just in general gameplay, it, it really affects how it feels. It's upsetting to see a game like Singularity not offer well-designed opponents, when there are so many creative ways to dispatch them. The most creative addition to the standard shooter weaponry is the Time Manipulation Device, or the TMD, and it's definitely the biggest gimmick on offer here, and that's not intended to detract from how fun it is to use, it's just the truth. Through the course of the game, you are given automatic upgrades to the device, but its main function is to age or repair a depressingly small amount of objects, predominantly boxes and staircases. The first time you figure out you can force open a bay door by putting a decrepit old box under it and then restoring it to its former size is a pretty awesome moment, but the TMD puzzles are for the most part pretty uninteresting. But a lot of them are optional, and that makes you feel a bit more proud of yourself for completing them. However, the game is far too easy to ever require the powers the device gives you, even if some of them are impossible to ignore. The most interesting ability the device gives you, the power to create orbs that freeze time within them, is criminally underutilized and comically overpowered, but it also is visually stunning and an amazing complement to the gunplay. Along the same line of weaponized time manipulation is the Seeker Rifle, an absolutely fantastic and memorable sniper rifle which allows the user to steer the projectile after firing. To balance the gun, it cannot occupy one of your two standard weapon slots and is dropped when out of ammo or when you need to switch to a new gun. No other weapon matches the wonder of the Seeker, but they are all more than serviceable, and never seem to overlap in their uses. It's refreshing to see a host of weapons that all have their own roles and circumstances of usefulness. What makes this more pronounced is the fact that some of these weapons have an ability tied to them. The sniper rifle allows you to slow down time when looking through the scope, and the grenade launcher's secondary fire lets you steer the path of the explosives, and so on. None of them feel unnecessary, even if they are introduced at too slow of a drip for such a short game. And something that makes their introduction even more irritating is the decision to make them upgradable with a finite, discovery-based material. I really enjoyed the addition of weapon upgrades and how they reward exploring the environment and putting your past puzzle experiences to use. However, I hate when games introduce exploration-based upgrade systems and then don't quickly give you all the weapons in the game. It's a weird complaint, and it's probably kind of unique to maybe just me, and it's also a really hard decision from a design standpoint for variety's sake. But after I've dumped a ton of resources into two weapons, and then another gets thrown into the mix that I really enjoy using, I get upset. I feel that these hidden collectibles either need to be a flat, passive upgrade applied to player health or damage or something. With the decision to have all these tied to a single weapon makes me feel guilty and like I was putting all my eggs in the first basket I could get my hands on. A good solution to this can be found in something like like Ratchet and Clank, that tied weapon growth to its use. It organically powered up weapons based on direct player feedback, and it gave players who experimented a pat on the back while also rewarding those who had settled on their favorites. Another approach to this that I found pretty cool, but ultimately a little awkwardly implemented, was in Wolfenstein The New Order, which gave specific mini-objectives for player growth while also hiding collectibles that increased the player's pool of health and armor. Despite this, the guns are all very fun to use, and I don't want to act like they aren't. Even without these upgrades, they definitely could have carried the game, and the upgrades are just an icing on the cake at this point. I just really disagree with how they're in implemented. The assault rifle feels sturdy and accurate, the shotgun spreads limbs across the floor, and they all just function how they should and feel great. Sadly, another insult to their impressive design is the decision to restrict you to only carrying two weapons at a time, and only allowing major weapon switches happen at predetermined areas in the game, where you also apply upgrades. The choice to have wild weaponry that is upgradable and all extremely situational, but then lay such a harsh restriction on your carrying capacity, does nothing but punish creative player choices and general experimentation. It also backfires by irritating the player and just sliding into the dominant strategy, and robotically working through the game from there. It was a trendy and misguided design choice. A quick aside, something that I feel should be mentioned here, is that I have pretty strong feelings toward the things like the minigun and rocket launchers and shooters. Often shooters will throw a BFG at you in the late game, a behemoth weapon that can ravage enemies in an attempt to make the player feel powerful, instead of trusting the player to have naturally gained familiarity and mastery of the game's systems. They just give you guns that make enemies die quicker. A shooter will toss something like an impossibly sized minigun into your hand and say, look at you, don't you feel like a badass now? And I 
don't. You know what would make me feel like a badass? Clearing a room with a pistol. Destroying insurmountable odds with seemingly unimpressive weaponry. And I know this doesn't make room for progression that I welcome in games, and, and there are always self-imposed challenges to be had, but sometimes I wish shooters would allow for the development of actual skill, as opposed to just giving the player better weapons. These problems are inherent to shooters in general, though. And also, because shooting with a mouse is so much easier than shooting with a controller, so there have to be added methods of balance and so on. They're opening all evolve, but let's move on. Singularity's old-school inspirations can be found spread across all of its systems, but it's pretty apparent in its level design. There are mandatory platforming sections, long simple corridors, and the usual host of labs and sewers, but there are moments of true brilliance here, and at times the developers allow for some gorgeous and fascinating visual scenes that shrug off their adopted simplicity. In film, you can force a perspective upon the viewer and create living, vivid pictures, but in gaming it's much harder to trust the player to witness screen scripted set pieces, and meticulously crafted things like some back office desk that some guy named Kevin spent three months poring over. A lot of games now have remedied this by sticking in prompts to warn the player that something worth seeing is happening, or they just take the control away completely. The Bioshock games are an example of handling this very well, with worlds so perfectly constructed that they hold the bar a bit higher for the player and expect them to soak in the details, so as the player you naturally follow suit. Older games in this respect gave a lot more trust in the player to witness their games or just paced and built their levels with the knowledge that thousands of people will eventually prod around in them. And even if Singularity isn't particularly pretty, there are moments that are truly spectacular and ask the player to slow down and stare. Even the opening menu sets the tone for what amounts to a cinematographic recommendation, a massive fist holding a sickle erupting from a choppy ocean with a sparsely overlaid menu. I was consistently surprised surprised by this as I played through the game. The forced framing at the opening of the game as you climb towards the facility, the shocking moment you walk through a portal and see the crumbling facility you're in come alive, or vice versa. It's great, visually thrilling stuff. Despite all of this, the developers of Singularity clearly wanted to make a fun game, and they succeeded at that. And I could be accused of saying far too much about a silly game like this, but I think it's important to consider the cult favorites, but also to consider how cult favorites became cult favorites. Often they're spawned from poor critical reception, poor sales, and so on. And people's tastes change, society's tastes change. More than anything, criticism is dependent on time and place, especially if it's intended to act as a recommendation to purchase or ignore a release. So yeah, Singularity was slapped rightfully for a lot of poor design decisions, for its old-school direction, its sloppy pacing, its half-implemented systems. So as time went on and the game got cheaper, older, and more shrouded in obsolescence, more people played a fun game and decided to pick up a torch in its defense. If the game got a few more 8s, maybe less 6s and 7s, would the game just be considered decent and be forgotten? Is the game only still an occasional point of conversation because people People have deemed it worthy of defense. I don't know, but I do know that I enjoyed my time with Singularity, and I think it's far more important to share the knowledge of something fascinating rather than risk the chance of watching good ideas atrophy and fade. Thank you so much for watching.